right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. The most important thing I can remind you today is not to come to class on Monday. I think you have your priorities straight. Priorities are straight, yes. So three-day weekend. We won't be here on Monday. Feel free to email me if you've got any questions, though. I'll be answering emails. Happy Darwin Day. So today's Uncle Charles' birthday, born many, many, many years ago. And I, unfortunately, because I like to dress up when I teach, I didn't wear one of my evolution themes t-shirts, like suck at natural selection, I'm still here. But that's just proof that I survived brain surgery and reproduced so that, you know, I was one of those people that took advantage of modern medicine to uh, cheat natural selection. <laughs> Hopefully the reason I had brain surgery is not hereditary because then I'm doing bad things and passing those genes on to my kids. Oops, but, you know, suck it, natural sin. <laughs> we succeeded. So we got very close to the $500 goal within like $10 or $12 or something. So I chipped in the rest, got us up to $500, doubled that to 1000 I sent that in today since it's Darwin's birthday. I figured it was appropriate to send the thousand dollars into Baba's fund. So nice job. The rap guide to evolution of course already exists, but again the idea is that as we keep summarizing concepts in natural selection, doing group collaborative work, turning them into verse, then at some point in the near future I'll send a lot of those to Baba and he will consider them for inclusion into the custom rap that he'll produce for our class. And I was just thinking last night that one of the things I'm going to try to do, since a lot of you are biology majors and a lot of you are seniors and hopefully graduating this spring, yes, some of you, some of you, I'm going to try, if we get the movie by the end, by the start of May, I will do everything I can to get it shown at the biology department banquet. We'll see. So last time we were together, we kept talking about phylogenetics, practicing, reading trees, redrawing trees. These are just a few bullet points. I'm not going to read them. Basic concepts that I've tried to help you understand up to this point. Last time we spent particular attention on the last two, measuring branch lengths and trying to understand that the shorter the total distance between two tips on a tree, the more closely related those individuals, those species, those populations are. Well, I just posted a Google Classroom assignment. If you did happen to draw a phylogeny of your dinner, and you did it digitally, then if you'd post that to Google Classroom, I can show it. If you don't want me to show it, then you don't have to do it. But I know there's at least one in there right now. So we're going to go check that one out. Do, 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 do. Dinner phylogeny. Ah, we've got a few selections in here already. Let's see what's in the first one. Uh-oh. I can't open any of these. Ah! Wrong file format. Oh, well. Tell you what. Keep trying. I'm going to redraw the first one that I saw today. So you try to guess. I did this, and then I tried to guess what the dinner was without actually asking the student first. So I'm going to draw a selection of the taxa that's on this dinner phylogeny. You play the game, what was for dinner last night? Yeah, the oats might throw you off. I, I asked, and I understand why now. But we have a winner. It was pizza. You win the prize. There was a prize today. 
The prize today was a t-shirt that has a drawing of a platypus and it says, go home, evolution, you're drunk. <laughs> so, pizza. So if you're gluten-free, maybe, or you want to cook something that's not including regular flour, you might grind up some oats and use oat flour. Okay, so what are the major clades groupings, monophyletic groups in this tree? How are these organisms grouped? Does it make sense? Is this an accurate phylogeny of these species? So we've got, we've got a fungus. Yeah, plant products and animal products. So it is very basic. Yeah, makes sense. So the animals share a common ancestor, the plants share a common ancestor, and then there's fungi. Yeah, it came from, presumably it came from an animal, unless it was animal milk, or unless it was almond milk. That, okay, fair enough. So this is a, was it blue cheese? So it wasn't inoculated with some sort of a fungus. So an excellent point. <laughs> yeah, we can't tell on this tree whether or not, so getting back to the question from last class, how do you tell species boundaries on a tree? Here, it's unclear whether or not the cheese was made from chicken milk <laughs> or from some other animal. So we could, say, cow, heifer, whatever you want to write. So that would suggest maybe that that cheese is more, the cheese is more closely related to cows than to chickens. Maybe it was goat cheese. Yum, good on pizza. I'd like to see some roasted red peppers added on there in that case. But. So on that tree, this is for all of you, not just the one of you that made this. From that phylogenetic tree, what were the traits or characters that we, we used at least to make those broad groupings, the monophyletic groups? We had fungi, we had plants, we had animals. So what traits distinguish those three groups? It's like basic biology. Okay, so plants, right? So if you have chloroplasts, right? That's a that's a trait. Do you have chloroplasts or not? It distinguishes plants from animals. What else? What about animals? What's a trait that all animals share? Pardon? Heterotrophs, we move. So there's, there are a lot of concepts, technique, or techniques, characters, also known as traits or phenotypes. So I'll use those three words interchangeably to represent any sort of phenotype, any sort of trait we can observe that we can use to ask which character or which organisms are more closely related. The basic evolutionary principle, which you probably already know, but I just want to state it explicitly for the record, is that we have this approach in evolution that if two organisms share a trait, they're more closely related than a third organism that doesn't have that same trait. And we can use all of these that your textbook indicates. We use all these types of phenotypes to build phylogenetic trees. So you can look at morphology, shape, for example. So I've got four limbs, chimpanzees have four limbs, tigers have four limbs, plants don't have four limbs. Therefore, I'm more closely related to chimpanzees and tigers than to plants. What about behavior? Do you think that's a valid thing to use to assess relationships between species, how they behave? Maybe, so I heard a yes and a maybe a little. Totally valid points. And this is something that's hotly debated, so this is another point where there's no right answer in evolution. Scientists use all of these types of traits to distinguish who's more closely related to who. Development, certainly, so that's this slide. So watching what it looks like as an embryo develops. 
can tell you something about how, more, how closely related two species are from each other. And then what does this panel represent? Yeah, genetics. DNA sequences is something that in modern times most scientists use to develop phylogenetic trees. So you just look at the genome sequences of two species and you ask how similar are they. You compare that to the sequence of the genome of a third species and that lets you build our typical tree structure. So two genomes are more alike, more similar in sequence, then that would suggest that sort of a tree. But what are the issues with this? Especially, let's pick on behavior. Behavior can be environmental. Sure, behavior can be influenced by environment. So if you're studying a trait that's learned, how does that, if you're studying a behavior that's learned, which we'd have to do additional research to find out if the behavior we're studying is a learned behavior or an, a heritable behavior. Why heritable? Why is heritable important? That's, yeah, evolution, natural selection, right? One of the three key requirements of natural selection is that the traits that we're looking at be heritable. <laughs> Bottom line for this slide, summary, take home point, is that there's a lot of argument among evolutionary biologists in which of these types of traits is best for inferring a, a phylogeny, making the hypothesis about the relationships between species. Sometimes morphology is good, sometimes it's not, sometimes behavior is more useful. Some, so what about a combination? is the suggestion. And that's exactly what most phylogeneticists, people who build phylogenetic trees, do today. So a major approach of building phylogenetic trees and understanding how organisms are related to each other is to look at as much data as we can, as many characters, as many traits, as many phenotypes. You put all of those data together and you ask, what's the overwhelming pattern? Do most of the traits, be they genetic or developmental or physiological, morphological, behavioral, do they all suggest the same relationship? So another take home message, relying on one trait to build your tree is usually considered a bad approach. The more data you have, the more characters or traits you use, the more robust, the more likely it is that your phylogeny, your hypothesis is representing the true relationships between species. Any questions or comments about this? Now we're going to get into vocabulary. This is a heavy vocabulary chapter. But again, this is all important to understand because we're, I'm going to be using these terms a lot. So I'd like to help you understand homoplasy, symplasiomorphy, synapomorphy, morphy, morphy, morphy. So here's an exercise that I produced. I hope you'll follow along if you got your tablet actively working. So I've listed five traits along the top, and we've got a phylogenetic tree that represents one hypothesis about how all of the organisms on the left, sorry, on the right, are related to each other. Who's the outgroup? The shark. In this tree. So sharks <clears throat> are the outgroup. Because we have to go farthest back in time. present here to find the common ancestor of all of the organisms shown on the tree. Sharks branch first, so they're the outgroup. They're sort of the representative of what that most recent common ancestor of all of these species might have looked like. Might have looked like. Okay. So let's map onto this tree by drawing little dots at the branch tips. Let's see, thick skin. So 
So which of these organisms has thick skin? It's a trait, right? You can. So let's see. Rhinos. Where's rhinos? Yeah. Rhinos. Not necessarily horses, but rhinoceros. What else? Manatee. Sorry, what was that? Elephant. Elephant, yeah. So this is an example, hippos. This is an example of a trait that exhibits homoplasy. So are all of these organisms related to each other? You better say yes, because they're all represented on one tree. <laughs> they all share a common ancestor. But are there other more closely related organisms to those four that we don't consider to have thick skin, pachyderms? Like rodents, for example. So the homoplasy is a trait that seems to be, well, homoplasy is a deceptive trait. This is an example of a trait you do not want to use to build a tree because it evolved presumably multiple times. Right? Elephants and manatees are closely related to each other, but there are other organisms in between primates and rodents, bats, canids, and felines that don't have thick skin. So if you built a tree using this trait alone, right, good example of a trait not to use for building a tree, then you'd get a totally different relationship theorized, hypothesized among these organisms. What's the other homoplasy that I listed up there on the top? Crocodiles? Oh yeah, crocodiles, we could add that to crocodiles as well if you'd like. So of those five traits along the top, what's the other homoplasy? Wings, right? We've talked about this before. The winged flight evolved multiple times. So you find it in birds, you find it in bats. But are birds and bats the most closely related species or groups of species to each other according to this phylogeny? No. And we know that that's true because bats are mammals. So that's another example of a trait that you would not want to use to build a tree. You'd get the wrong, based on other knowledge, you'd get the wrong shape of the tree. You'd put birds and bats as sister species if you only built a tree on that trait. So if you write anything down on your paper or your tablet or in your brain, homoplasy equals bad. We don't want homoplasies. These are cases, these are interesting cases to study because this means that evolution has caused the same trait to evolve multiple times. So flight has been selected for in different lineages, which is cool. And it makes sense that flight might be a beneficial trait to have. Like help you fly away from things that are attacking you. But bad trait for studying phylogenetics. The opposite of that is the homo, or sorry, homoplasy, that was the homoplasy, it's anapomorphy. So draw on there, placenta, I say, is a synapomorphy. So put a dot in that column where, for every organism that develops a placenta, live birth, essentially. see. How far up the tree do I have to go before I stop? Manatees, elephants, platypi and opossums? Platypi lay eggs, so no. Right, so opossums have a pouch, so they're non-placental. So this is it. So elephant, manatee, primates, rodents, cows, whales, hippos, bats, horses, rhinoceri, canids, dogs and cats, canids and felines. Do all of the organisms that have that trait share a single common ancestor? Yes. Right there. Are there any species in that clade, monophyletic group, that do not have this trait? Is there any organism that descended from that common ancestor that doesn't make a placenta? Females, anyway. No. 
that is a synapomorphy. So this is the perfect type of trait to use to draw a tree because it accurately represents a trait that was presumably inherited from that common ancestor. So if the common ancestor to all these species had a placenta, then that trait was passed down to all of the descendant species. When in genetics do you hear a term that's related to, I'm going to try to help you remember synapomorphy. When in genetics class did you hear, or maybe cell biology, did you hear a word that's related to synapomorphy? So I heard, pardon? Yeah, so when chromosomes are in synapsis, what happens to the two molecules of DNA? They pair up next to each other. That's what a synapomorphy does. The synapomorphy has synapsed a bunch of independent branches together into the node. So you could imagine that the, when you start drawing this tree, every one of those species that emanates from that node is a different branch. The synapomorphy synapses or brings together all of those descendant species. In other words, like I said, it's a perfect type of trait to use for phylogenetics. A synapomorphy is a trait that defines a monophyletic group. So what would be another, what's a synapomorphy for mammals? Hair. Yeah, hair. So it's another synapomorphy. Hair only exists in mammals. All mammals have some form of hair. So it's a trait that defines that clade, that monophyletic group. What about egg laying? This is an example of a different type of trait. Who lays eggs up here? So birds, platypi, platypuses, whatever. Crocodiles, lizards, amphibians, fish, sharks. Do any of the ones down in the bottom half lay eggs? Those are all live bearing. I'll toss them on down. So. Am I right? Sharks. Some sharks. Don't they? Do they? Hmm. Somebody Google it quick. So, while some of you are looking up whether or not sharks lay eggs or not, what would, this tree, what would the tree look like if you just looked at the trait of egg laying? It's both. So which organisms would look most closely related on this tree? What would the shape of the tree look like? If you just said, OK, I'm going to look at all of these types of species. I'm going to look at this one trait. Right? One trait is bad. This is an example of why. So we're going to say, you lay eggs or you don't. How are you related to each other? What would that tell you about birds and ray-finned fishes? You would say that it's a monophyletic group, right? That it all comes from the same common ancestry. Right. So the tree might look like the egg layers on one half of the tree, and the mammals and marsupials and monotremes. No, not monotremes, marsupials and mammals. on the other half of the tree. So that would make it look like ray-finned fish and birds are more closely related to each other when really ray-finned fishes and sharks are the outgroups. They're most closely related to everybody on the tree. Yeah? Um, it says that there, some species are legs and some... Yes, and they're birds. 
Ah, interesting. Yeah, there's a video on YouTube of a, Ooh. Of a shark coming out of a baby shark coming out of the water. Hey, cool. Everybody go to YouTube and look at the <laughs> sharks giving birth. Nice. I didn't know that. So I learned something new today. Thank you. Ooh, so what does that tell us about the use of sharks as an outgroup for the trade of egg laying? Some sharks lay eggs, some sharks don't. Does that mean why it's an outgroup? Because it does both? And it doesn't fit into either one of the other two groups? Could be. So it's a, this group of sharks has created, has evolved both independently, which makes egg laying not only a symplesiomorphy, a symplesiomorphy, by the way, means it was a trait that was inherited by the common ancestor. So the presence of egg laying in sharks suggests that it was probably a trait that was present in that common ancestor so many, 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 many years ago. And it was passed down to ray fin fishes, coelacanths, reptiles, amphibians, birds. And then what happened? We lost it. So somewhere about here. But the thing with the sharks is like, you may say that it wasn't lost. And the other group that lays the, uh, that actually gives live birth was the one that we chose, was the trait that we chose to keep going on. Indeed. Which is why evolution is fraught with peril, because it all depends on how much you know. The quality of your tree depends on how much you know about the trait that you're using to build the tree. So symplesiomorphy is an ancestral trait that was lost in one or more groups. The reason that, that the textbook and I point out the perils of symplesiomorphies is because they, again, like homoplasies, might lead you to draw a misleading tree. So we want what sort of trait? We want the synapomorphies, the traits that define monophyletic groups. So a trait where every single species you can find that's related to that common ancestor still has that trait. That's the perfect trait to use for inferring relationships. We're going to do a bit of practice a little bit later using these terms. So we've talked about synapomorphies. We've talked about synapomorphies, homoplasies, symplesiomorphies. OK, so that was all about those next two slides that I just skipped past were everything we did on the first slide. So those terms across the top are all about traits. Traits are symplesiomorphic, synapomorphic, homoplasic. Then we've got a different set of terms that we use to describe the structure of the tree. I've already just introduced the idea of monophyly. So where's a monophyletic group up here that we haven't talked about yet? Pardon? The aquatic ones. Exclusively aquatic. Oh, exclusively aquatic. That's homo, yeah, so homoplasic. Okay. So there are a lot of different species up here, including a mammal species or two, that are exclusively aquatic. It would be another bad trait to use to build a tree because whales are definitely not closely related to fish. Weirdly enough, they've got hair, so go figure. They're mammals. What about a synapomorphy? So where's, where is there a monophyletic group on this tree that we haven't talked about? No, reptiles, lizards, crocodiles, and birds. Lizards, crocodiles, and birds. So that's a good one. So it, here's another monophyletic group. They all share a recent common ancestor. So that defines a monophyletic Group. Like placental mammals also form a monophyletic group. 
So that must mean there are traits that we call what that define that group. Right? There are some synapomorphies. There's at least one synapomorphy that defines that group, all those three organisms. Does anybody happen to, I don't remember one offhand, I'm sure some of you might. What types of traits do lizards, crocodiles, and birds have that tell us that they have a most recent common ancestor that doesn't include the other species of it? The scales on their feet. So some sort of scale. Scales on their feet would be birds, and then scales on the body. Right, so scales, in this case, is a synapomorphy. It defines that one group of organisms as being more closely related to each other than other species. So that's monophyly. Polyphyly means the opposite. It means it's a group that has, you're looking at a trait and the structure of the tree is such that, for example, pachyderms, they're not all most close relatives to each other. It's not monophyletic, it's polyphyletic. Those individuals using this one trait, you might think are close relatives, but they're actually distributed across the tree with intervening species that are actually more closely related. So those are the two tree-shaped terms that I care if you know or not, monophyly and polyphyly. Monophyletic group shares a common ancestor, a polyphyletic group does not. Questions or concerns? It's like taking the SATs all over again. We're going to do a little bit of what's in the upper left. So there's a direct relationship between these terms, which may or may not help you remember. I just offer this as one more way to think about these. So if there's a homoplasy, that's going to produce a group that is polyphyletic. And a synapomorphy defines a group that's monophyletic. So the synapomorphies and monophyletic groups is what our goal is in building trees. Like going back to high school. Right. So these next two terms are more terms that are important to understand just because they'll be used in class and in discussion and on exams. It's really simple. These have direct relationships to terms we've just discussed. These are just new ways of saying the same thing. A homologous trait limb development, for example. So the fins of a bat, sorry, the fins of a porpoise, the wings of a bat, the four limbs of humans, cats, horses are homologous traits. They're all the same. Does that make this a homoplasy or a synapomorphy? All of these organisms developed different types of forelimbs, but they're all evolved, they're all derived from the same structures during development. So this is a, an example of a synapomorphy. This is a good trait to use for building a tree. So we can look back during, this is an example of a developmental phenotype or trait character that we would use to infer relationships between species. So you can look during development at how bone, bones form, and we can see as you look through embryos of these different organisms as they develop, that the forearms of the human form in exactly the same way at the exact same time during development as the forearms of the cat, the wings of a bat, the fins of a porpoise, and so forth. So they're related to each other. What's the opposite of a homology or homologs? An analogy, which if you flipped ahead to the next page, of course, or read the textbook or already knew about this. So this is what sort of a trait? We look at a habitat like grasslands. 
and we see that there are fence lizards that blend into their environment. And we see mice that also have coat colors or skin colors that blend into their environment. And the same is true if they live on lava fields, either lizards or pocket mice. And the same is true for the populations that live in light places. So, yeah, is, is light coat color, scales, or fur a synapomorphy? Do, are those two species closely related because they both have the same coloration? No. no. Why is it that the fence lizards that live in light environments and the mice that live in light environments have the same coloration? So it's an adaptation to environment. How many times did that trait evolve? Did, we, did it come from a common ancestor of lizards and mice? No. So it must have evolved in an ancestor of lizards and separately in an ancestor of mice. So tra some traits you might look at, this maybe is a bad example, but there are traits that are much more subtle. You might think, oh, that's the same trait. Therefore, those species must be close relatives. This is an example of when that's certainly not true. We know that mammals and lizards are from different taxa. The fact that they share this one trait doesn't make them close relatives. So this is not a synapomorphy. This is the other, the bad one, a homoplasy. Right? The independent evolution of what looks like the same trait in two totally unrelated lineages. If you just build a phylogenetic tree using this trait, boy, what would that look like? Right, you'd have something like this. You'd have lizards and mice being the light ones being close relatives. You'd have lizards and mice that are, I don't know why I'm not writing E on mice, the brownish ones, and then you've got the lizards and mice that have dark pigment. That's the peril of the homoplasia. So we don't want analogy, we want homology. We want synapomorphies, we want monophyletic groups. Now in, please engage your brain and open your eyes. Sorry that took so long, it always does. Upper left picture. Do you see an analogy or homology? Wait, so what was that? Okay, analogy. So what's analogous in the picture in the upper left? Okay, so we have two different, but wait, who said homology? Pardon? They're both mammals, so they've got hair. So that's a homology. They derived that from a common ancestor. But then some others of you have looked at the wings first. That's an analogy. Not all mammals fly, it's just that there are flying squirrels and bats. Those are related, they're both mammals, but they didn't both obtain those traits from the common ancestor of bats and flying squirrels. Are there other homologies or analogies in that picture? This is, again, there's no one right answer. They, they have live birth, placentas, they both have eyeballs. Homology. Okay. We'll skip skinks and pristina. That's the bottom left. Regeneration is the point there. They can both break off parts and regrow them. What about bottom right? Do you see homologies or analogies? We've got seahorses and we've got kangaroos. What's a homologous trait? They've both got a pouch. Is that homology or is that analogy? analogy? That's analogy. So marsupials and seahorses happen both to have pouches where they carry their young. They're not close relatives, I hope. Maybe you'll agree with me. 
Seahorses and kangaroos? OK, good. And then there are homologies you can find in that picture as well. So if, if I ask you something like this on an exam, or not on an exam, just in conversation the next time we meet at a dinner party or something, right? All you have to do is find a trait and explain your answer. Right? There won't necessarily be a right answer. I'm just looking to assess your understanding of the concept. So you might look at the kangaroo and the seahorse and say, they both have tails. Ooh. Tails. Is that homologous or analogous? I don't know. If you look at the development of fish and you look at the development of mammals, Isn't that one of those, like, lost traits? we lost. So that's one of those we lost it traits. We lost it, mammals, but not all mammals. So just so the non-human primates don't have tails, but other mammals do. So maybe that's a homology. I'll leave that for you to investigate. Tails and fish and in other non-human mammals are those homologies or analogies. All right. So these are some goals that I have for you for the two chapters on phylogenetics that we've been talking about so far. What we did today was map traits onto a tree. So that was the phylogenetic tree of all of the many of the vertebrate species, mapping who's egg-laying, who's not, those sorts of things. To want to identify synapomorphies and not homoplasies, to be able to determine who's more closely related, which pair of taxa would be more closely related. And then, as we did last class, if I give you a bunch of trees, to be able to look at the structures of the trees and tell me which ones are the same tree with branches rotated and which ones are totally different trees. So I've got a quick example, some types of questions that I might ask. So here's a relationship between a genetic tree. So this is based on DNA sequence. So presumably, these are the real relationships, even though it's a hypothesis. Presumably, this is a good hypothesis for the relationships between five species of fish. These are all stickleback fish. So let's see if we can get through some of these questions on the right. Based on the diploid number of chromosomes, which is 2n, that's how many chromosomes an individual has, an individual nucleus. How many chromosomes did that common ancestor likely have? So I heard 42, and then I heard, why not 46? So if that individual way back in time had 42 chromosomes, where would there be changes from 42 chromosomes to 46 chromosomes on the tree? Down at the very bottom. So you could say, if we started with 46 chromosomes, Sorry, if we started with 42 chromosomes, there would have to be a gain of the trait of having 46 chromosomes there mm -hmm. in the common ancestor of those three species, the nine spine, the brook, and the four spine stickleback, except how is that still not quite right? Mm -hmm. So then we have to have a change back to having 42 chromosomes somewhere on that branch of the tree. Mm -hmm. So that requires, so we start with 42, so that makes sense there. So we've got one, two changes on the tree if we're right that the common ancestor had 42 chromosomes. What if the other was true? For those of you that said it's 46, how would you explain this tree? There has to be a change for the common ancestor with three spine and black spotted. Okay, so we have to lose 46 chromosomes and go to 42 in the common ancestor of those two species. Then there has to be and then it also has to be a loss of 46 and a gain of 42 chromosomes there. So that's how many changes. Two. 
yet another example of when there is not one right answer. So both of those explanations, you could say the common ancestor, I think, had 42 chromosomes, or you could say 46. What's the principle that we're using here? It's one of the principles of tree building. Parsimony. Right, the principle of parsimony, that the tree with the fewest, the explanation with the fewest number of changes is the most likely one. In this case, we can't tell whether or not the common ancestor more likely had 42 or 46 chromosomes because to explain the current diversity in the number of chromosomes of these species, either hypothesis would require two different mutation changes, evolutionary steps on the tree to explain the current diversity in the number of chromosomes in these species. What about relationships between the nine-spine stickleback and the three-spine or the four-spine? Don't tell me that there's a seven-spine in there somewhere. So here's the nine-spine stickleback. Is it more closely related to the four-spine or the three-spine stickleback? So you go, the common ancestor of the nine-spine and the four-spine is here. That's closer in time to present, the branch tips, than the common ancestor that you'd have to go back to to get three spine and nine spine. So nine spine and four spine is the answer to that question. The third one, if the number of chromosomes was the only it's just example questions again, so hopefully you're enjoying getting a glimpse into what exams might look like and the sorts of questions that evolutionary biologists ask. If this was the only trait we had, the number of chromosomes, how would this tree change? How would we draw it differently if we were drawing a tree that was just based on the diploid number of chromosomes? So all of the ones that have 42, right. So we draw a line here, there'd be a polytomy. The black spotted, the three spine, and the nine spine stickleback would all look like they were equally closely related. If this is the only trait we're looking at and they all share the same trait, we don't know who, which of those three is, might be more closely related to the others. And then the two species that have 46 chromosomes would be sister taxa. So in red, that would be the tree that it would look like if we were only using that one trait. So that's why using multiple traits is useful, because just using one trait to build a phylogenetic tree sometimes gets you, what's it, have, what's it called when three or more branches split from the same point? Polytomy. A polytomy. Looking at one trait, you often get this. But what we want is no polytomies. We want one branch splitting into two. That gives us the best phylogenetic trees. Okay. So then the last question. If the tree that existed before I drew all those red, arrow, red lines on there was the true tree, the real relationships between these species, would that make the number of chromosomes that these species have a synapomorphy or a homoplasy? So where were, so is there a monophyletic group that has 46 chromosomes? No. Is there a monophyletic group that has 42 chromosomes? No. So that makes this a homoplasy. So if you, that's the, that red tree. If you build a tree just on that trait, you'd get the wrong relationships between the species. The real relationships being shown in black. So the sorts of questions that I'm interested in and hope be comfortable in performing. The next time we come together, we start talking about how to actually build trees. So, so far we've been looking at trees, interpreting trees, mapping traits onto trees, but how do you take traits, coat color, number of chromosomes, DNA sequences, and actually build the trees in the first place? That's what the next chapter in our next class meeting on Wednesday starts getting into.
So the first step, which hopefully you're still thinking about in terms of writing the term paper, and we'll do a little bit more work on that the next time we meet, choose a population or a species to study, obviously. Have a question, have a group of organisms that you want to make a phylogenetic tree for. Then we have to choose the traits that we're going to study. We talked a little bit about choice of traits today. We want traits that are synapomorphic, not homoplasic. Next time we do the stuff that's in the boxes. So how to actually turn data traits into trees. So for next time, there are a few sections of chapter 5 to read. And then I'd also like you to do this next assignment. This is, again, to try to help you do a little bit of background research into what sort of topic you might want to write into your term paper on. So find any sort of published scientific manuscript. You have a PDF of it, so just any manuscript that has a phylogenetic tree somewhere in it, a figure of a tree. Hopefully this is on a species that you're interested in or a question that you're interested in. So bring it to next class. You don't have to turn this in. I would like you to attach the PDF to the Google Classroom assignment I'm posting. This is why I'm asking you to find the manuscript in the PDF document. Attach the PDF to Google Classroom. Bring answers to those three questions. And then also post a, a comment on that assignment. Write the citation for the paper you've posted. Because we need to talk about citations, because for a term paper, you can have to make a bibliography, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page about the format for bibliography. So scientific citations. So find a paper that has a phylogeny, answer those questions, post it to the classroom. Oh, I'm out of breath. I'm out. I'm spent. If I had a mic, I would drop it. Have a wonderful three-day weekend, and I'll see you on Wednesday.